Hey, welcome back to the Piano Bench. Today I'm going to be building a sous vide controller. Uh, sous vide is a method of cooking where you uh, put the food in a vacuum sealed uh, plastic bag and then cook it in a precise temperature water bath uh, for long periods of time. Uh, so I'm going to build one using an old crock pot and uh, a bunch of electronics mostly which came from my junk bin. So let's get started. I'm going to start with this cable. This is just a computer cable. Now in this receptacle they've uh, color-coded the screw terminals to show which is the live and which is the neutral. Uh, but you can also tell based on the uh, larger plug in a modern NEMA 515 outlet and uh, the larger one is the neutral. It's important not to over tighten these types of things. This is crimping the entire cable, so you want it really firm, but uh, not so firm that it you know, pinches the, um, the insulation too much. So that's a good mechanical fit. Okay, and there we have our uh, outlet pigtail. You have to be careful when um, cutting the outer insulation to not nick the uh, insulation of the internal wires. So what I often do is um, just score it and then bend it to, uh, to break it entirely. Now, I like to use ring terminals uh, whenever I can. This makes a very nice mechanical uh, attachment for stranded wire like this onto screws like this. Uh, otherwise, you're kind of just wedging this in there and pinching it, and some of the strands of the wire inevitably fray or don't get nicely crimped. Um, so this just makes a nice, clean, secure um, mechanical attachment. So uh, to use these things, I like to use a ratcheting crimper like this. And uh, the way you do it is um, you strip just about a quarter inch, so not very much, uh, twist those together a little bit. And then I sort of spin this as I'm putting it so we don't get any bird caging. Uh, that's when the strands of wire uh, sort of bunch up. And you want to have just a little bit peeking through like that. And then you use the appropriate color um, crimper and uh, the Colors represent the, uh, the size of the wire that, uh, that's being used. Fit that in. Crimp. Then I always test it, make sure it's really nice and secure. That's nice. Now I just realized I don't have any marettes uh, small enough for this gauge of wire, so I'll have to get some later. Um, but for testing, I'm just going to use some electrical tape. Alright, so now we essentially have an extension cord uh, that's interrupted by this solid state relay. I'd like to test whether this SSR gets very hot, uh, so I've wired it up to a uh, 5 volt supply and uh, I'm just going to run it at a 100% duty cycle for a while uh, in order to warm up a little bit of water and just see how hot the SSR gets uh, and decide if I need the heat sink or not. Uh, 
I'm using one of these DS18B20 temperature sensors. Uh, it's potted in a little stainless steel tube and has one meter of wire on it. Um, but on the board, I have a little header. So I need to attach this little end onto uh, the wire here. And to do that, I have a special crimp tool to, uh, to put these fiddly little clips onto the, the wires. So the first step is to trim them down to about an eighth of an inch. Uh, and these ones I've uh, soldered. Actually, you know, instead of trimming them, I'm just going to bend them over. And that gives me a little bit of extra material to crimp to. I haven't really found a perfect way of attaching these yet. Uh, they're so small and the wire gauge matters a lot and it's, uh, it's just really tough to get a, a really good connection. But anyway, uh, so I, I usually put this end in first. And the nice thing about the ratcheting mechanism is I can tighten it to just before it's going to start crimping. And that holds it in there. And then I can take a wire and fit it in there. And as soon as it's at the right spot, I can crimp it the rest of the way. So with those all attached, then we take uh, this little casing, and as you push it in, uh, a little spring tab clicks into the rectangular opening and locks it in place. There, perfect. So everything on the board is hooked up for testing now. We have a solid state relay plugged into uh, the relay terminals here, um, which is essentially just connected uh, through a MOSFET to one of the GPIO pins on the microcontroller. Uh, we have our um, one-wire sensor here, so that's a DS18B20 temperature sensor, and that's plugged in here. And then we have uh, I squared C here coming off uh, for our um, our display and uh, and power coming in here. Well, I got to work putting this all together uh, using a junction box that I bought from the Home Depot. And I probably should have gotten a larger box because it was quite a puzzle to get everything fit in there. Uh, so we've got uh, solid state relay and I've derated this. This is a 40 amp solid state relay and uh, I mean we won't even be putting four or five amps through this if that. So um, it's, it's uh, lots of uh, margin there. Um, this is a wall wart here and I've soldered and shrink wrapped uh, heat shrinked um, some leads on there so that I can actually get power uh, from the main power lead that uh, that drives the element as well. We also have a, a DS18B20 right on the board and I'm going to use that to make sure that we don't overheat in here so uh, to monitor the temperature of the uh, solid state relay. Uh, there's also a programming header and a reset and programming set of buttons right there. Uh, and then I just uh, cut some holes and use some cable glands here. We've got uh, the, uh, the outlet and this here goes to a plug and then this little cable gland here goes to the, uh, the temperature probe. And, uh, and that's about it. Now one concern I have in a box this small is there's not very good separation between the high voltage and the low voltage. And the last thing I want is a um, a wire to come loose or some, something to shift and make contact and have uh, a wire that's expecting 5 volts get 120 volts AC. So what I've done is made a couple little uh, plastic pieces here and cut them out so that uh, they can divide the box up nicely. So all the high voltage stuff is kind of over in this side and under there. So this um, this separates it quite nicely. Now for the front panel, I uh, laser cut some nice red acrylic and uh, I laser cut two pieces here. Um, one is a spacer and then one is the front panel. And then um, I've put a couple switches, a potentiometer and uh, the, the uh, LCD display and that's just uh, affixed with glue gun. I'm thinking I might do one more layer of clear acrylic that goes over this that can cover 
uh, the LCD and also engrave some sort of uh, logo or something down here. I've included this potentiometer because it's a pretty cool way to adjust the set point uh, rather than using push buttons it's a nice, uh, nice silver knob. Uh, the trouble is there's only one analog input on the ESP chip and uh, it goes from 0 to 1 volts so in addition to the voltage divider in the potentiometer I've added another voltage divider here to uh, bump the 3.3 volts down to 1. And I've put this uh, end on so it plugs into the header on the board. Now for the control firmware, I use the Arduino PID library. PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative, and it's a great method of controlling um, something like this where precise temperature is required. When I first started using it, I noticed that uh, there was a tendency to overshoot. When I turned on the, uh, the system, it would uh, start with a water temperature of, you know, about room temperature, 20 degrees, and the element would be on 100% and it would climb and get warmer and warmer and when it hit the set point which at this uh, in this case was 60 um, it would start to drop off the power output to the heating element but uh, that didn't matter it still overshot quite a lot all the way to 70 degrees and um, and finally it shut off the element completely and the water cooled over the course of uh, well almost an hour before it was back to 60 degrees and then the controller turned on the element a little bit in order to maintain that and uh, and if I would left this longer it would have eventually steadied out at exactly 60. Now to improve upon this situation I had to tune the PID loop and what that means is adjust the weightings of each of the P, I and D terms. At first I tried an auto tuner and, uh, and that adjusts the output and then monitors how the system reacts. So in this case, uh, we're pulsing every 20 minutes the, um, the power output a little bit and then monitoring sort of the delay the, um, and how much lag there is in how the water responds to that uh, in terms of its temperature. And this worked okay, but it still didn't really solve the problem. So I scrapped auto-tuning and uh, did a lot of reading about manually tuning a PID loop and um, just made adjustments, tried it out, monitored it, and adjusted some more. Uh, in the end, I think I've found some tunings that work fairly well. Um, in this example, the set point is 61 degrees, uh, and by the end we can see that it's, uh, you know, it's pretty much bang on 61, very stable. Uh, when I turned it on, it uh, rose to, oh, about 61.3 or so. And then um, this disturbance here is when I put uh, probably a cold piece of meat into the, the sous vide. And so that um, it reacted to that and uh, heated that up. And it overshot to about 61.5. Um, and then settled back down to 61. So uh, for me, that's, that's acceptable. I'd like to give a shout out to Brett Beauregard, who is the author of the Arduino PID library and has an excellent blog on the subject. He's written some excellent articles on tuning and some other factors in getting good performance out of a PID controller. Thank you.